All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we have our National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, joining us for the briefing, who will give a brief opening and then take some questions, and then we'll proceed with a briefing after that. With that, I'll turn it over to Jake. Thanks, Shannon. Good to see everybody here today. As you all know, President Biden held a secure video call today with President Putin. The call covered a range of issues, but the main topic was Ukraine. President Biden was direct and straightforward with President Putin, as he always is. He reiterated America's support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. He told President Putin directly that if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States and our European allies would respond with strong economic measures. We would provide additional defensive materiel to the Ukrainians above and beyond that which we are already providing. And we would fortify our NATO allies on the eastern flank with additional capabilities in response to such an escalation. He also told President Putin there's another option, de-escalation and diplomacy. The United States and our European allies would engage in a discussion that covers larger strategic issues, including our strategic concerns with Russia and Russia's strategic concerns. We managed to do this at the height of the Cold War, and we developed mechanisms to help reduce instability and increase transparency. We've done this in the post-Cold War era through the NATO-Russia Council, the OSCE, and other mechanisms. There's no reason we can't do that forward, going forward, provided that we are operating in a context of de-escalation rather than escalation. The United States, as we have been for some time, is also prepared to support efforts to advance the Minsk Agreement in support of the Normandy format. This could include a ceasefire and confidence building measures that helps drive the process forward. As I said before, the discussion between President Biden and President Putin was direct and straightforward. There was a lot of give and take. There was no finger wagging, but the President was crystal clear about where the United States stands on all of these issues. We believe from the beginning of this administration that there is no substitute for direct dialogue between leaders. And that is true in spades when it comes to the U.S.-Russia relationship. So President Biden welcomed the opportunity to engage clearly and directly with President Putin. Indeed, as President Biden said after his meeting in Geneva in June with President Putin, where we have differences, I want President Putin to understand why I say what I say and why I do what I do and how we'll respond to specific kinds of actions that harm America's interests and indeed harm our allies' interests. That's exactly what he did today. After the call, he spoke with the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, and the UK to debrief them on the call and to consult on the way forward. Our team is presently debriefing the embassies of NATO members, EU members, and key Indo-Pacific allies. The President will be speaking shortly with the leaders of both houses of Congress and talking to them about ways in which the administration and the Congress can work together on a bipartisan basis to stand up for American interests and values and stand behind our friends and partners. And President Biden will be speaking with President Zelensky on Thursday following on yesterday's discussion between President Zelensky and Secretary Blinken. In terms of next steps, the President and President Putin agreed that our teams will follow up on the issues discussed today. The President and our Europe, his European colleagues agreed that our teams will work together to ensure that our engagement with Russia going forward both involves and is closely coordinated with European allies and partners so that we are all on the same page. There's a lot of work to do in the days ahead. As we pursue diplomatic channels, we will also prepare for all contingencies, just as we have been doing for weeks now, including through the preparation of specific responses to Russian escalation should they be required. Specific, robust, clear responses should they be required. That's where things stand as we speak, and with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Yes. Mr. Jay, could you elaborate on what you just said about fortifying allies on the eastern flank there? Is sending U.S. troops to the region on the table here? So uh, what I'm referring to there is in the event that there is a further invasion into Ukraine, a military escalation in Ukraine, obviously many of our partners on the Eastern Front, our, our Baltic allies, Romania, Poland, other countries, will be increasingly concerned about the security and territorial integrity of their countries. They will be seeking, we expect, additional capabilities and potentially additional deployments, and the United States will be looking to respond positively to those things in the event 
that there is a further incursion into Ukraine. So is that something the American public should be bracing for, the possibility of seeing American troops on the ground in that region in the coming weeks and months if Vladimir Putin goes through with this? I don't know if I would say bracing for, since we currently have rotational deployments in the Baltics. Uh, we conduct exercises on a regular basis in both Poland and Romania. The presence of American uh, military service members in rotational fashion in these countries is not something new. The question here is not that uh, about whether or not the United States is going to send American service members to the territory of our NATO allies. We do that as a matter of course. The question is, what additional capabilities can we provide to ensure that they feel strong and confident in their own sovereignty and territorial integrity? It is those additional capabilities that are on the table in those countries uh, should uh, uh, Russia move in Ukraine in, in a more decisive way. Yes. Okay, thanks so much. In the days leading up to this call, the White House and administration officials said repeatedly their assessment so far was that Putin had not made a decision over whether to invade Ukraine. So did President Biden get clarity from him on whether or not that is his intention? We still do not believe that President Putin has made a decision. What President Biden did today was lay out very clearly the consequences if he chooses to move. He also laid out an alternative path, an alternative path that is fundamentally in keeping with the basic principles and propositions that have guided America in the Euro-Atlantic area for the past 70 years. And ultimately, we will see in the days ahead through actions, not through words, uh, what course of action Russia chooses to and take. Yes. In your statement, one, sorry, Jake, one quick follow-up. In your statement of the readout of the call, you said that the United, the President Biden told him the United States was ready to take strong economic measures and other actions if needed. What are those other measures that the United States is prepared to take? I just spelled those out in my opening remarks, both the supply and provision of additional materiel as well as uh, the additional uh, deployment of assets and capabilities okay, to to uh, NATO members in the event that there's a further encouragement. Okay, tell us what, what are the strong economic measures, and how are they different from the ones you put on Russia in 2014, which didn't deter Russia from taking Crimea? Why will, what are they, and why do you think they'll work better this time? I will look you in the eye and tell you, as President Biden looked President Putin in the eye and told him today, that things we did not do in 2014, we are prepared to do now. Now, in terms of the specifics, we would prefer to communicate that directly to the Russians, to not negotiate in public, to not telegraph our punches, but we are laying out for the Russians in some detail the types of measures that we have in mind. We are also coordinating very closely with our European allies on that at a level of deep specificity. We have experts from the Treasury Department, the State Department, and the National Security Council in daily contact with the key capitals and with Brussels to work through that package of measures. But I think it is not profitable for us to lay out the specifics of it standing here at this podium Thank today. You. Thank you. Um, did President Putin ask for President Biden to commit to not allow NATO or Ukraine to join NATO? And did President Biden make any kinds of concessions such as a reduced U.S. presence or any um, commitment on NATO and Ukraine's membership? I'm not going to characterize President Putin's side of the conversation and or go into details in terms of what they discuss because I think they need to have that space uh, to be able to have a uh, robust exchange. But I will tell you clearly and directly, he made no such commitments or concessions. He stands by the proposition that countries should be able to freely choose who they and associate with. The, the material yes. that you said that you're going to send, following up on Caitlin's question, how quickly can that be delivered? We have an ongoing pipeline that delivers uh, various forms of defensive assistance to Ukraine. Indeed, there was the delivery of defensive assistance to Ukraine just very recently, and, and that will continue. So it really depends on the type or form, but it sh this should not be thought of as uh, a circumstance in which you completely turn off the dial or turn on the dial. There is an ongoing pipeline whether that pipeline needs additional supplements as we go forward will depend on how circumstances evolve. Yes. Thank you so much. You have said that the administration will take action if Russia does escalate militarily. Satellite images show that hundreds of Russian troops are amassing on the border with Ukraine. Isn't there already a military escalation underway? Why wait to take action? So our view on this is that the fundamental 
uh, object of the policy the United States is pursuing in lockstep with our European allies is to deter a Russian military uh, invasion of further territory of Ukraine. And the measures we have put on the table are designed to show the Russian government that should it choose to engage in such an invasion, uh, there will be those consequences. That for us is a clear and decisive lay down. Uh, and we also believe that there should be an alternative pathway by which we can make progress on diplomacy in the Donbass through the Minsk agreement and the Normandy format and by which we can address NATO and American security concerns and Russian security concerns through a larger mechanism consistent with the way we've operated over the course and, of the past 30 years. Some Republicans are accusing President Biden of being too weak on President Putin. They cite the fact that sanctions were eased on Nord Stream 2 and the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was widely criticized. How do you respond to that criticism that President Biden is being too weak with Mr. Putin? I make three points. The first is that uh, Vladimir Putin standing behind then-President Medvedev in 2008 invaded Georgia when we had 150,000 or more troops deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. So the connection between our deployments in foreign wars and the calculus of Russian leaders when it comes to the post-Soviet space, there's not good evidence to support that. Number two, when it comes to Nord Stream 2, the fact is the gas is not currently flowing through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline which means that it's not operating, which means that it's not leverage for Putin. Indeed, uh, it is uh, a leverage for the West, because if Vladimir Putin wants to see gas flow through that pipeline, he may not want to take the risk of invading Ukraine. And then number three, the president has shown over the course of the past eight months that he will do what he says he's going to do in response to Russian actions. So President Putin can count on that. He said he would impose costs for Navalny, he said he would impose costs for solar winds. He did those things, and if Russia chooses to take these actions in Ukraine, he will do the same. He's not doing this to saber rattle. He's not doing it to make idle threats. He's doing it to be clear and direct with uh, both the Russians and with our European allies about the best way forward. And we think this stands the best chance alongside a pathway uh, to de-escalate uh, to uh, avert a potential crisis with respect to an invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so Russia suggested, suggested in recent days starting talks on a new European security pact. Did Putin bring this up and did President Biden agree to start those talks? Again, I'm not going to get into the details or characterize what President Putin said. Uh, and uh, I will say that formal agreements or formal treaties were not on the table in the conversation today, but the straightforward notion that the United States, flanked by our European allies and partners, would be prepared to talk to Russia about strategic issues in the European theater, uh, that was on the table, and we are prepared to do that, as we've been prepared to do that throughout both the Cold War and post-Cold War eras. What the right mechanism for that is, what the agenda for that is, and what comes of that, that is all to be worked out as uh, we see how things proceed in the coming days. Since late October, why hasn't the U.S. given additional material to Ukraine yet? This has been escalating for weeks. Why wait? <laughs> As I just pointed out uh, in response to an earlier question, we are continuing to deliver uh, defensive uh, material assistance to Ukraine. Uh, we have done so just in the past few days. The, the, yes. the Kremlin readout said that President Putin proposed to President Biden that both lift all restrictions on diplomatic missions that have been imposed in recent years. Can you say whether that's something President Biden is open to or whether it's something he spoke to on the call? President Biden is open to creating functioning diplomatic missions in both countries. Uh, but he didn't make any specific commitments with respect to the best pathway to do that. What he said was that his leaders President Biden and President Putin should direct their teams to figure out how we ensure that the embassy platform in Moscow 
uh, is able to function effectively, and uh, as we believe, the embassy platform here in Washington is able to operate effectively for and, the and Russians. And just to follow up on Nord Stream, have you sent any message or had any meetings with the incoming German government on this issue? Are you urging the new incoming government to essentially threaten to pull support for this pipeline if there is an incursion, a further incursion into Ukraine? We've had intensive discussions with both the outgoing and incoming German governments on the issue of Nord Stream 2 in the context of a potential invasion. I'm not going to characterize it beyond that, other than it is a, an object of great priority for the Biden administration. Biden, his waiver on, on I'm sorry. Um, so, the, obviously, the summit is being watched by a number of other adversaries, inclu including Chinese President Xi Jinping. Some observers have described a nightmare scenario where uh, President Putin invades Ukraine and also simultaneously pres uh, President Xi uses force to reunify Taiwan with China. Is the U.S. prepared to deal with such a scenario? The United States is going to take every action that we can take from the point of view of both deterrence and diplomacy to make sure that the Taiwan scenario you just described never happens and to try to avert the uh, invasion and deter the invasion into Ukraine. That is the object of our policy right now. Those are the steps we are taking. That's what President Biden is doing and the messages that he's sending to President Putin. And with respect to Taiwan, the sum total of the efforts we've undertaken over the course of the past eight months in the Indo-Pacific have also all been geared towards avoiding any kind of scenario where, where China chooses to invade. Yes. Is there any promise from the Russian side to use leverage uh, to change Iran on its position? Yes. The President and uh, President Putin had a good discussion on the Iran issue. It was productive. Russia and the United States actually worked well together, even in tense circumstances back in the 2014-2015 period, to produce the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This is an area where Russia and the United States can continue to consult closely to ensure that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon. Why did Ukrainian officials first deny that there was any truth buildup when Washington started putting out the information and then change their tune after the meeting with Blinken? So I'm not going to characterize the decision making of the Ukrainian government only to say that we are in daily contact with senior officials in uh, the Ukrainian government. I'm in nearly daily contact with my counterpart in the Ukrainian government, and we believe that we are seeing a common threat picture here. And our message to uh, our friends in the Ukrainian government, as our message was today to President Putin, is that the United States supports the Minsk process, wants to see progress made towards a ceasefire, towards confidence-building measures, and that is the best way forward. Yeah. yeah. Is the world safer today after that conversation between the two leaders or less safe? And then I have a follow-up as to your answer. So all I will say is that um, the ultimate metric for whether the world is safer or not is facts on the ground and actions taken, in this case by Russia. Let's see. We are prepared to deal with any contingency, as I said at the outset, and I'm not going to make predictions or characterizations. I'm only going to say that, that President Biden will continue to do all of the necessary prudent planning for a variety of different pathways that could unfold in the Middle East. Is there any aggression in the Middle East that this administration is going to redo the Obama deal, lifting sanctions, and freeze millions of dollars to this uh, regime that is going to be spread to the proxies like Hezbollah? Hezbollah became stronger and stronger from the money that Obama gave to this particular uh, militia. So is it this going to happen? Are you going to address the proxies of Iran this time at, at the table of the negotiation? So I'd make three points in response to that. Since Donald Trump made the decision to pull the United States out of the Iran nuclear deal in 2018, Hezbollah has continued to menace Lebanon and the region. Uh, Iran's proxies in Iraq and Syria and Yemen have continued to move forward. So not being in the nuclear deal has hardly been a solution to the proxy. Second, nothing about the nuclear deal stops the United States' capacity to deal with those proxies, and we are prepared to do so. In fact, in response to attacks on American forces in Iraq, the United States has twice under President Biden taken action, a uh, direct military action in response to those proxies, in addition to uh, undertaking sanctions. And third, ultimately, an Iran with a nuclear weapon is going to be a greater menace 
in partnerships with its proxies than Iran without one. And so it is our determination to ensure they never get a nuclear weapon in diplomacy is the best way. Yes. Can I follow up on Iran, please? Um, you know, the Iranians announced that they're going back to negotiation uh, on Thursday. The administration uh, criticized them last week, and they said they were not serious. In fact, they reversed the progress. What makes you think that, apart from hope, that actually they are serious this time? And how much of a time you're willing to do it? And secondly, your counterpart, you negotiate with your allies and you coordinate with them. Your counterpart in the UAE is visiting Tehran as we speak. So is this a unilateral effort from the Emirates to do it or to reach to Tehran, or do you think this is a coordinated effort with the United States? I'll, I'll put this quite simply. The more Iran demonstrates a lack of seriousness at the negotiating table, the more unity there is among the P5 plus one, and the more uh, they will be exposed as the isolated party in this negotiation. Uh, so really, the ball is in Iran's court as to whether it wants to show up and demonstrate that it's going to be serious or not. Looking forward to the meeting with our, the conversation with President Zelensky later this week, are there any steps or compromises Ukraine might be able to make to find a way to end this peacefully? So again, as I mentioned before, we're in constant contact with senior levels of the Ukrainian government. Um, Secretary Blinken just spoke with President Zelensky yesterday. I'm not going to characterize the specifics of their proposals, but they have come forward with constructive ideas for how to move the diplomacy forward. We're encouraging that. Uh, those are steps they're taking, and they're asking the United States to support them in trying to get uh, towards a ceasefire uh, and then ultimately get down the track of diplomatic resolution. We believe that that uh, is good and uh, positive, and I believe that President Biden and President Zelensky will discuss that diplomatic pathway when they speak. Can I just ask you about Nord Stream 2? You said uh, Putin should, you know, if he wants to risk the pipeline not being turned on. Have you um, made clear to allies that you will, in fact, sanction the remaining entities that are involved in that project if uh, there is an invasion? And have you received any assurances from Germany when Chancellor Merkel was here, there was discussion about uh, what to do if Russia weaponized uh, those gas supplies. That nothing came of that, even though there were some pretty some saber rattling by the Russians uh, in, in recent months. Have you now received assurances from Germany that they will, in fact, not proceed with that? So in response to an earlier question, I said I wasn't going to get into the specific sanctions measures that we intend to impose, although we will be communicating those directly to our Russian counterparts, and we will be working through them detail by detail with our European counterparts. What I will tell you is that the subject of the future of Nord Stream 2 in the context of an invasion of Ukraine by Russia in the coming weeks is a topic of utmost priority. It has been discussed thoroughly. I'm going to leave it at that for today. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, uh, how the tensions between the United States and Russia can affect African countries? And my second question is, how do you summarize this meeting? It was productive? It was good? Or not? It was a useful meeting. It was useful in the sense that it allowed President Biden to lay out in clear and direct and candid terms where the United, United States stands on this issue, and to do so having coordinated closely with his allies and partners beforehand, and also to talk about a potential way forward. Uh, now, on, on the question of, of African partners, this is true the world over. The attempt to change the territories of another country by force should be vigorously opposed by every country in the world, including every country in Africa. I'll, take, I'll just take one more question. Um, what was Putin's demeanor over the course of the two hours? Did he signal any willingness to back down? Again, I just um, make it a practice not to characterize the other side's position. He can speak for himself. I would say that his demeanor, like President Biden's demeanor, was direct and straightforward. Uh, and again, as I said in my opening remarks, this was a real discussion. It was give and take. It was not speeches. It was back and forth. Uh, and President Putin was deeply engaged. And, um, and I'm going to leave it at that in terms of trying to characterize where he is. All I can tell you is there is a tasking coming out of that meeting by the two presidents to their teams to start talking about uh, how we might think about the diplomatic path. 
president made clear throughout that diplomacy has to come in the context of de-escalation rather than escalation. And now we will watch what unfolds in the coming days. And, and I will thank you guys. Okay, thank you, Jake. Welcome back anytime. I think I can speak for the group. Um, okay, 